Okay, hello everybody and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Scott Bellis. I'm a counselor for the BC Yukon region of Canadian Actors Equity yes. Association. And I'm also your current council president. I wanna thank everybody for joining what has to be one of our most popular workshops uh, to date. I think we can all agree that one of the many ways our industry has changed over the past three years has been the growth of remote auditions, whether that is a self-tape uh, that you send in or uh, uh, an audition live over Zoom. That does not appear to be going away anytime soon. And I think a lot of performers are still wrestling with how to approach this work uh, when we're no longer in the room together. So luckily our guest today will bring a wealth of experience and knowledge to this conversation. But before we begin, I would just like to read a land acknowledgement statement as well as equity's uh, statement of affirmation. So I'm uh, out here in Vancouver, which is situated on the unceded traditional lands of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Uh, these peoples uh, have lived around the Salish Sea for countless generations and have been the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters for many, 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 many generations. I acknowledge the special relationship that these people have to the land, uh, which is ongoing to this day. Uh, Equity's statement of affirmation reads like this. Equity embraces an open and inclusive environment and encourages respectful behavior that affirms the dignity of all individuals. Equity further recognizes our shared responsibility for vigilance in creating and maintaining this environment. Uh, equity recognizes a shared history with indigenous First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples in Canada in honor of those who have gone before us, equity commits to working toward understanding and actionable practices of reconciliation. Thank you. All right, welcome to the 11th in a series of workshops and seminars that equity has been proud to bring you on topics of great importance to our members and to our community at large. Uh, we wish to gratefully acknowledge the government of Canada for the funding of these programs. These programs have been funded through the Department of Canadian Heritage as part of their Canada Performing Arts Workers Resilience Fund. So we're quite grateful uh, for that funding. After this workshop, we will be sending all of you a link to complete a very brief survey. We really want your feedback on these workshops and your guidance as the membership as we plan for future ones. Okay, as usual, if you have a question, I encourage you to use the raise hand option or put your question in the Q&A section. If you put them in the chat, they may get lost. There's a lot of people attending today. But if you put them in the Q&A, they will get queued up. We will try to get to them as, as we go. Okay, now I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Stephanie Gorin. Stephanie has been casting in Canada for over 25 years now. She has worked in film, television, and stage. Just a few of her credits include Shazam, It, Home Alone, The Tudors, Fargo, Reacher, and with an E, Dear Evan Hansen, Come From Away, Kinky Boots, Les Miserables, Mamma Mia, and The Lion King. She is a Canadian Screen Award nominee, an Arteos winner, and an Emmy winner. Very impressive. Thank you for being here, Stephanie. Now I will hand You're things welcome. over to our moderator for this discussion. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you performer and equity counselor for the Quebec region, Dina Aziz. Welcome, Stephanie, and welcome, Dina. I hand over to you. Take it away. Thank you, thank Scott. You. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, Stephanie, for being here. Um, You're welcome. As we've learned from our conversations, you are very busy. Um, so the, <laughs> the time you're taking is much appreciated. And also it's great to hear that you're busy because that hopefully translates into jobs for our performing members. Um, I, I think a lot of our members probably are not familiar with working on projects where there's a casting director involved. So maybe you could just start off by explaining a little bit about what a casting director does in live performance audition processes. 
Um, usually I'm only brought on if it's a very big show because a lot of casting for theater happens in house, which I'm sure many of the people here know that. And so that's where you have to reach out to the theater and hope they'll give you an audition or your agent will try to, to accomplish that. But if I'm working on a, a very big show, you know, like let's say when we did something like Lord of the Rings, where we were looking for singers and we we're looking for dancers, we we're looking for acrobats, uh, same thing with Lion King. Uh, we would put out notices through the agents. We put out notices through equity. And then we'd also have to go into the real world, like the circus world or wherever that may be. And so we call all the talent, uh, tell them how to audition. Many were in person, many were by tape, even at that time, because it's coast to coast. So the idea of taping auditions has gone on for a very, very long time. It's just that I think the art of doing it has been perfected just because of the needs due to COVID. And also people living in different coasts and wanting to work in Toronto or Vancouver or or the East Coast or Montreal or wherever that may be. So I would um, call those people if it's a self-tape. I watch every self-tape and we'll send back notes if they're right for the show and maybe just need some tweaking before we present or I might just present it. Or, we, you know, I could watch a thousand or like Dear Van Hansen was well over 1700 tapes. And from that, we would then choose the people to bring to the callbacks um, who the director and producer would see, which is basically their first round. It depends on the team that I'm working with. Some teams may say, hey, I'd like to link ahead of all the people you might like to see. And then when COVID hit, a lot of it was being cast by tape or because the teams go off and start working on another production, perhaps in Australia or wherever that may be, I would then have to send selections to them there. And then they'd work out a recall, whether it be by Zoom or, or by tape or if one person can make it in person, that kind of thing. So um, besides that, we also look after, you know, coming up with the packages, the sides, the sides and the music and getting everything out to the performers. I guess we're the liaison, really. Right. That's the best way. It sounds think. like an incredible volume of material that you're looking at for a given project. Yes, yes it is. So we've had an awful <laughs> lot of questions in advance and there are already more popping in here and I'm going to jump right into questions. Okay. How do we stand out? What makes a, an audition tape stand out to a casting person? Well, so the first thing that makes you stand out is that you're right for the role or that you have the potential to be the right, right for the role. And of course, it depends on if it's straight theater, if it's a musical. If it's a musical, you know, um, sometimes there's a certain tone that is needed depending on the style of music within the, the musical itself. Like if you are a, a classical, legit kind of singer and we're looking for a rock and roll voice, try as you might, as talented as you are, that may not make you right for the role. So um, the things that are going to make you stand out, one is that it is a good tape. You can see the lighting that I've got going on here. This isn't great lighting for a start because <laughs> I had to exit my office to, to let the others have it. Um, we want to be able to see you clearly. We want to be able to hear you clearly and that you've really, you know, invested and you're connected to the role. And anybody who's like that and is interesting, even if you're not right for that role, you could be right for something else or I'll make notes. Or I've had people in auditions that suddenly I'll go, you know, not right for that, but sure would like to see him for this role in this TV show. So um, those kind of things happened. Uh, being well prepared is one of the number one things. And if you're talking about auditioning by tape, in person, it's being well prepared. And also this is an important thing to get across on your tape too, is that you are a person that the producer wants to work with because it could be a role where four different people could play that part. And who's going to get it? It's going to probably the one, uh, be the one who has the kind of personality that they think would be really great for the company that they would enjoy working with and, and that they're open. Um, what's the difference or is there a difference between taping for live performance and what people are maybe more familiar with, with uh, digital auditions is for TV and film. Should we frame differently? Should the setup be different? Uh, should the style or size of performance be modulated? Uh, no, and yes, and no, and yes. Um, <laughs> that was a lot of questions in one. Um, 
I would, it's, it's interesting because uh, for, for me and having to do it much more over the past number of years, I've found that performers have really gotten a handle on what to do, both transitioning from theater to TV film and from TV film uh, actors who are also uh, then wanting to do stage. Um, I think it's all about being very connected to the material and making your read very natural and very believable. I don't think it needs to be bigger over the top, but if you are playing a role that maybe is more character or over, over the top, if you're doing it for TV and film, it doesn't need to be projected. I mean, I think that's the 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 biggest tip there. I am. I had a very extremely well known uh, singer who has been a star in many shows all around the world who they wanted for for the tutors at one point. And I remember just having him sit real close to me and say, okay, now just tell me, tell me what you wanna say right here. And we just kept doing it closer and closer so that you learn not to project it as much because it was going on camera and you wanna keep it natural. So certainly for TV and film, if you're playing a big character role and you really wanna belt it out and you feel like you uh, singing wise, I would just say step back a bit and shoot more waist up as opposed to being really on top of um, on top of the camera, um, play it back, make sure that the sound doesn't get distorted, that it's a nice clean sound that you're having going on there. And quite often you don't need a mic so much for that if it's something you feel you really need to project. Um, in terms of the acting, I would do it exactly the same way as you would for TV and film. You want, so you want us to be a non, Even if it's a non-naturalistic um stage project project still play for a camera i i would still play for the camera for sure because we have all kinds of odd characters in tv and film as well if you think of all the different you know whether it be sci think of sci-fi or think of if you've suddenly got a big disney show or something like that it's still it, it still has to be natural and grounded even if you're, there's a quirkiness added to it, which you can still do, but it shouldn't be too big and too broad for the most part. And I think if it is something where we're looking for something very broad that we will say so, feel free, do one natural and feel free to do one as broad or playfully as you want. I think that that's kind of the job of the casting person if you're taping to tell them that. Um, okay, so in terms of number of takes, if there aren't specific instructions, how many takes is it okay to send? And what order should you put them in? The one <laughs> that the, the one that seems to adhere to the the sides or the one that you feel is more interpretive and more uh, your take. That's a tricky one too. Let's say let's say uh, you know, the words can be sacred to the writers, right? And so I think you want to, I think generally, unless you're doing a show that's kind of second city-ish or something like that, um, that you want to stick to the lines. I think you want to do that for your first take for sure. If you have to change it the second time to free it up, what is your reason for changing it? Is it because you don't think the writing is good enough and you think you can write it better? Or is it because you want to show a section of it a little bit looser? You know, that's, those are two different reasons. I, I, or, or is it because you're have you're struggling with, you know, working with the lines as they are written? And I think that you've got to find a way to make those lines work for that first pass, no matter what. And then if you want to do a second pass to a second, I wouldn't do more than two. Okay. And I would send them on separate links because then we can watch and then decide the amount of hours I've spent watching multiple takes and then having to divide those up. You know, I let's suppose there's three scenes and, you know, I, I don't like three scenes, but let's suppose you've been given three scenes as I'm getting stuff from the States. You know, if I'm getting eight takes because I'm getting three and three and two and I have to go, I want the third of the first one, the second of the, da, 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 da. you know, that takes a lot of time to edit. And, you know, believe it or not, we want you to look um, as good as you, you can look, because if you look great and the tapes are great, it makes it look like we know what we're doing, or at least we can fake it very well. So we we do want to show your best takes for sure. A, a lot of people have questions about slates. Are they still needed, necessary 
uh, and should you attach them to your auditions or as a separate file? I think if you were doing your audition once through, then I would attach it and on to that same audition. That's just fine. I think a slate is important. The thing about a slate is you can just be yourself in the slate. Just make it natural. Be careful with slates. So sometimes I remove them if somebody seems really cranky or like, I really don't want to do this slate. But hey, my name is Scott. I'm six foot two. You know, it 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 should should be welcoming. It should be a nice slate. Um, it should show more of your full body, even if you can't go to the feet. You know, because then we get they get a sense of uh, what you look like as opposed to just being framed head and shoulders, which is generally the best way to frame. Obviously, if you want to move around a little bit, it might be more mid shot, but definitely somewhere in your audition, you should come in like this because we should be drawn into what you're doing. So um, slate, if you were doing, again, if you're doing more than one take of the scenes, I would also put the slate separate because then we can, you know, submit it to the director or producer that way. That makes a lot of sense. Um, how do you feel about props being used in an audition uh, if the scene calls for something I don't know a phone or a piece of paper should you actually physically use that or do the bad mind <laughs> I think it's fine to use a phone I think uh, I, th I think it's fine to use a phone you just got to be careful you don't turn too far off camera sometimes it's better to pretend it's a speaker phone, you know, like you've touched your speaker phone. And so you can imagine that your phone is there and you're talking to your phone, but at least then we're going to see you a little bit better. So that would be my advice on phones. I find that uh, when people are doing a read where they're playing an office worker, secretary or something like that, that sometimes having that tangible thing in their hand helps them with their audition. That doesn't mean to say I need to see it. Because if you're shooting like this, I don't need to see that. I don't need to see your prop. But if it's helping you and you're feeling more comfortable because of it, that's fine. I don't like gum. Very rarely like gum unless it says they're chewing gum. You got to be careful then you're not throughout. So all we're doing is watching the gum roll around in the mouth. That's a little disconcerting and, and it's distracting. So you don't want to do anything that takes away from your performance because you're not going to be hired because you wore a funny hat. Excellent. <laughs> I <don't>, um, yeah, <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to picture that. Um, how about dealing with action? If if a if a scene calls for a lot of physical action, uh, what's the best approach to handling that in the constraints of a self tape framing? Like if you're being well, checked or if you're being if an you're action being... scene. Yeah, that's tricky. And do you do you find you get that a lot in theater? You actually get sides where you have to do that. I think that those sides are are not a smart idea necessarily. <laughs> I would put a note: please don't feel you need to be to chase. Um, I think the idea of of looking around like someone is after you and then taking a step or two is fine. You do not need to run in and out of frame. I have seen that. I recently saw an audition where someone went in and out of to frame three times to do a half a page of dialogue. <laughs> But they did sleep with their dog at the end, so I presented them. Um, <laughs> so um, if you need to do a bit of action, because you do, I mean, I have seen people pretend to do a slap kind of thing. Um, I wouldn't overdo it. I mean, just don't take away. The best thing to do is to watch it back yourself and think, you know, how busy is this? Can they still see that I'm a good actor? Am I getting across what I want to in the scene? Yeah, it's still showing them a bit physical. I mean, I have seen that before where someone has maybe done it and then kind of knocked themselves against the wall because there's that kind of thing going on. And I, I think that's okay. And sometimes that will help you as well within the scene because it is physical and it changes the way you breathe and, and mm -hmm. how you show yourself. So um, that is a tricky one. And uh, I think it's up to the individual, but I think it's okay as long as it's not too busy. Uh, how about eyeline, especially uh, given that a lot of uh, theater auditions are monologues? Should you go down the barrel? Should you go off camera? What's the best point of focus? That can that can vary. I find, um, I mean, you know, 
this isn't, this isn't necessarily for theater, but definitely for reporters and things like that, obviously you would do it into the camera. But I think often when you're doing a monologue, you're talking to someone. So I think doing it straight into the camera isn't necessary because if you think about how would you do it on the stage? Would you only do it straight to one spot? Or would you be thinking as you're putting across what you're saying, would you be moving around? You know, when we talk and I'm thinking even real right now about what the heck I'm gonna say, <laughs> you know, I'm looking down or I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. So you're not always going to be engaged in the same spot. If it's most comfortable for you to then to engage back to the, back into the camera, I think go ahead and do it. But generally I find it's better if you imagine there's someone that you're talking to that's just slightly off camera. But again, it should be real. In real life, we don't do it all to one spot all the time. You know, we don't. And I think that's the thing to, to think about when you're performing for the camera. Um, I just want to jump back to slates. Slate at the beginning or the tail? If you're attaching to the... Um, generally, it, that's a personal thing, I think. Um, and the casting director should tell you where. Generally, I like it at the end because my producers and directors don't have much time. They're watching a lot and right. probably from different countries if it's a big show, even if it's not a big show and if it's if it happened to be something big in Canada, um, they they it's not about how your slate. It's important to have it at the end to get a sense, but you wanna catch them right away with that acting. That's my That's my personal opinion. I know that there are some agents in town who send out, even though I always say at the end, almost 95% of the time, they send out their own little notice saying, don't forget to slate at the beginning, blah, 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 blah. And then I go, uh, okay. And then I have to edit it out and put it at the end if I know it's going to be, because the slate isn't always good. And, and I don't want it to be to take away. I want them to see the acting because sometimes how you appear in the slate, you you know, an actor feels different when they start acting. Um, a couple that's of personal, that's personal. Sure, I mean, ultimately follow the instructions. Yes. A <laughs> um, couple of questions for uh, singers. Accompaniment or a cappella? Well, I don't think in this day and age that you should have to pay for accompaniment. If you've got a friend who plays piano, or somebody you work with and you want to record that way, and that's the way that makes you most comfortable, then go ahead and do it. I think if it's a big show, and I believe this is in the agreement because I sure as heck always insist on it, that we uh, we get MP or the MP3 files, whatever, with the with the background music so that you can accompaniment, so that you can sing along with it. In which case, yes, you should use that. If no music is supplied and you can't find something you can sing to like off of YouTube or whatever, it's always better if there's musical accompaniment behind, but not if you're singing with another person, like if it's taken from YouTube and there's some other voice on it, then I, I think a cappella is fine. Just make sure you're very in tune and you're starting in the right key for the particular song. Um, question about the state of casting and the industry. A lot of people are wondering about when, if ever, we should expect that going back into the room may be the norm or there's a lot of disillusionment, um, mm -hmm. especially given how much of a learning curve this has been for performers. How do you think we're looking in terms of uh, eventually shifting back to what was familiar? Well, that's, well, that's a hard question too, isn't it? Because, you know, it's not like COVID's gone away. How many shows do I know where, you know, they've had to replace people suddenly or they shut down before they opened so that two that I know of in the past six months that had to postpone openings because of that or closed down for a week or that kind of thing. So that's a tricky part in terms of that. I think I have a feeling from what I hear from uh, the people I work with in the States too, that self-taping is going to stay for quite some time. I think they'll, I think that because there's so many performers now all across the country, 
and that uh, performers want to work wherever in Canada for the most part, that uh, I think self-taping self will stay and that recalls will happen in person, except if the person can't make it from you know, wherever they are, or they could be working overseas, or they could be on some cruise ship at the moment or wherever that may be. That would be my guess. I would guess that some of the th smaller theaters may do in person as well. Um, personally, the, the thing that I like about um, the self-tape versus just being in the room is that I can see so many more people many many more people and also you're sending me your best take you've probably done it four or five times unless you're brilliant and you got it the first time and good for you but if you have and you've sent me your best take or the best to your ability at this point we can't do that in the room if we're doing a musical for instance and we're paying an accompanist a hundred odd dollars an hour and we're paying for the space and how many people can we see you know each audition can take i you know some shows they can take half hour most shows you try to get it in 10 minutes, but that's difficult too. So there's not a lot of time in the first rounds. I'm talking about the first rounds yeah. to really um, redirect. And I, I really have enjoyed, I've had many, many performers who I've discovered that way or through quickie open calls and then sent the materials to learn and who've gone on and many of them are gone to Broadway and places like that. And I think that's the exciting thing is it's opened up the world much more because I bet if there was a big show and a lot of people on your your Zoom here wanted to be seen, here's 400 people or whatever. How many people is that theater going to be able to actually audition unless it's maybe Stratford who has, you know, tends to do a lot of shows and manages to see a lot of people. But it's your chance to be seen. I think it's your, your chance to perform. That's a, a nice way of looking at it. I, I, I certainly also recognize that for the people receiving the material. That's a lot of material to go through. Um, one of the things I know many actors are missing is the experience in the room of getting feedback. Now you mentioned earlier that there have been times where you have given feedback to uh, auditioners. How often does that happen? And and what advice can you give to actors who are feeling like they're sending tape out blind into the universe and they never know what happens with it? Well, I would hope that it's watched. I can only speak for myself is that it's watched because you never know what you're going to find or who you're going to find or, you know, this, this sudden inspiration that you see. <clears throat> so there is no way of knowing. You know, and you don't know when you go into a room with a casting person necessarily or or with a director, for sure, they may not give you any feedback. They may just say that was great and thank you very much. And there may not be the time to give you feedback. Doesn't mean you're not going to get a recall. But you don't always get that feedback and you can't. And it's the same in theater as it is with TV and film. If we're seeing hundreds of people, we can't give feedback to everybody. If somebody is a no, I don't have the time to write and say, I'm really sorry, but it's a no. Um, because it's, if, if it's a volume show, a show where we're seeing lots of people, which usually for me it is, because otherwise they'll do it internally. The reason they hire me is because the person internally doesn't want to go through a thousand auditions. So I don't have time. But if anybody is... I can hear them more or less, right? I mean, you know, I'm trained in music theater. I'm trained as a performer originally acting, then music theater, you know? So if I can hear, oh, you know what? They're they're switching too soon into their head. And I wonder if they can chest it up to a D on this because that's what we need for this role or to describe more about what we need within that scene before I present that tape to somebody in New York, I will do that. So I don't know if that how that's you know that's the best I can say from my from myself. I can't. Yep. I'm sorry, I can't answer for the world. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. But thank you. Thank you. Um, Although I know that sometimes things don't get watched. I know I've seen that. I've seen that. Yeah. Not necessarily. Even I mean, you're talking about theater. I remember one of the. I mean, my eldest son uh, got a three picture deal on a film. And he was asked to tape for something and he'd already taped for it and through the 
through the US and suddenly he got a request to tape for it. And I thought, okay, so they didn't watch it. Have another go. It's been four months and he ended up getting a three picture deal. No, we didn't mention, oh, by the way, it would have been good if you saw it in the first place. Why would we do that? <laughs> It just took it as another opportunity, you know. Well, that's so, the happy outcome. Um, but, yeah. But it's, I know, but it is volume. I mean, and what they have to deal with in the States is, you know, 10 to 100 times what we we do here. I think in Canada, there's more opportunities, but of course, there's less in terms of the amount of theater sure. overall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just want to remind all the attendees that for your more <clears throat> technical questions, Please take uh, time when you have time to check out the two previous uh, auditioning self-tape webinars that were done that were more focused on technical aspects. They're recorded and, uh, and posted on the website and maybe we'll slap a link in there somewhere. Um, demo reels. <laughs> is, is it useful to send a demo reel and under what circumstances? You mean for theater, to send yeah. a demo reel for theater? Uh, I mean, I if it's somebody I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't mind watching it to get a sense of them. But if it's somebody I do know, I don't think I really need it. But um, it, it's not necessarily something that they want in theater so much, you know? Maybe yeah. in a play, if you're doing a play, perhaps that could be useful. Okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, readers. Mm -hmm. There are lots of instances where there's a very short turnaround for an audition and regardless, it can be hard to find a reader when you're taping. Uh, is having a reader over Zoom going to be a strike against you? Does that create a, an issue? Um, no, I don't think so. I think if you can try not to tape yourself on Zoom, if you can have your iPhone or whatever set to tape yourself, you're going to come across um, nice and clean and clear. Um, and, but the other person reading with you on Zoom, I don't think that's an issue at all. I would practice it with them a few times because sometimes there's a lag and I think the lag can sometimes hurt the pacing on a piece. So that's the only thing I would say to watch for. Right. I've also in a, I mean, hopefully in under equity, you don't, I mean, we have for certainly fast turnarounds sometimes, especially if there's an illness on TV and film, you know, that can happen. In which case I have heard people who tape themselves with what they think is the right interval and use that if they've had to do it overnight because suddenly, oh, we need to wardrobe someone tomorrow. You know, that's a, usually a TV, uh, a film type of thing though, but I would hope that there would be time. Uh, given the volume of material that's being submitted for casting now, is it um, advisable or not advisable to submit to something where you've not been requested, like crashing an audition? Do you mean for um, you mean for theater? Mm -hmm. Crashing a theater audition? Well, if they're doing, I well, that is you know that's how I got my equity card. I crashed. So um, <laughs> uh, I think if you, you're sending in an unsolicited tape, I think that's okay. Just make sure it's on a Wii transfer so it's easy to download. If you're sending it in a bunch of crazy formats or the, it's just too big a file, you know, sometimes we just can't, we can't deal with all of that. I think that the, for me, I think that's fine. I think some theaters may not want it because they put it out through whatever, however they, and they take the time to pick who they want. But I would say, just make sure you're really right for it. You really believe you're right for it and not, oh, I think I'll be good in a few months. I can, I can reach that D or whatever it may be, you know. Uh, someone asked, what's a we transfer? You can look that up, <laughs> but WeTransfer is one of the easiest things to, to convert to. It's a and, platform for converting and sharing. Yeah. Thank you, Randy. Um, <laughs> presentation, wardrobe. Should you try and dress the part? Should you try and dress neutrally? Any advice around that? I would dress neutrally for the camera. You don't want a lot of busy lines and patterns for a start. You don't want to wear white 
preferably not black if you can help it it's okay i think it's a little be careful you got to be careful with your background like um here you know i have a plain a blue sheet that i hung up when the point came where occasionally i would have a audition you know down here just you know a simple a simple plain background is good not white and not black in terms of background in terms of the role itself uh, I don't think costuming for me, not costuming, but you know, if you're playing a farmer type, you know, I may, I may wear like a denim shirt and a pair of jeans, right? Or if you're playing the type of part, it's a woman who would wear a dress, then if you're comfortable wearing a dress, wear a draft dress. I would say keep natural, don't go using, I don't go making up like you're making up for stage. That's a big thing. Just be as natural as you can be, for sure. Great. Um, complicated question or a few questions around diversity and inclusion. Um, is that on the radar for casting agents if it's not designated as pertinent to a role? How can or should performers disclose uh, aspects of identity? Um. Oh, I think that's up to the performer. If the performer feels that they should disclose their identity because they believe they make it, because that's something that's been asked for in a breakdown, and and they want to say, hey, please consider me for this. You know, this I do identify that way. I think you know, I I think that all of that is private, and it's up to the individual. And if they want to disclose that and say, I think I'm right for this, and also I am blah blah blah, I don't think that's a problem at all. Um, I, if you see a breakdown where it doesn't specify that this person has to be white, for example, you know, because the father they've already cast is white and therefore the rest of the family in this particular instance is white, then anybody should be able to submit. Or it could be a black family. You know, sometimes I'll have a story that's centered around a black family. And so we will specify specify that in which case you know submitting yourself as a white person for a role that's specifically for someone black or i've been doing a casting that's indigenous i i really really don't like it when people who are italian or mediterranean uh, uh say yeah but i've played that before i don't you know i i don't think that this is the world where we can do that anymore i think that and that's the great thing about to, you know, being able to cast goes to coast and, and being able to do tape, you can see from all from all walks of life from all across the country. And I think we should do our best to cast the way that it should be cast. That's um, great, great words. Uh, is there such a thing as open calls on tape? I guess that's, is that like Yes. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Definitely, I'm. I'm hoping I'm going to have one <laughs> a little while, coast to coast, and that will be, you know, for um, any equity people who can't come in, or any any non-equity people, or hopeful equity people who who can sing from all across the country. And definitely, as that would be on tape, and they'll all be watching. A lot of Dervin Hansen was like that because there's no way I could have watched 1,700 people. I could sitting in my room. But, you know, and, and then there was a lot of work to be done at the recalls. So uh, my recalls and then their recalls, you know, because they wanted it perfect. Uh, social media. To what extent mm -hmm. does social media play a role in casting? You hear about stories of producers or whoever considering social media presence as a factor in casting. I haven't, I don't know. I haven't seen that at all for theater, but again, you know, there hasn't been as much theater for me with, with uh, a couple of shows that I had went down and one of them ended up going to Broadway. So um, they, they certainly didn't look at anything like that. I do see it occasionally in TV and film because a lot of the viewers are, you know, looking to who's got the most Instagram followers. Oh, you know, but it tends to be I find it tends to be lower budget projects like, you know, they, they might be doing a million dollar film and they want to get eyes on that film. So therefore they're looking for somebody who's got 
over a million followers on Instagram, and then it would be good to have them in a role because, because they will promote it. So they're getting an actor and an advertiser at the same time. I do not see it very often, though, not in the work that I do. And hopefully that's less a factor in theater. Oh, I, I hope so. I, ha I have not heard of it at this point. Uh, accents and dialects. Both in the instance where it seems quite clearly uh, indicated for a character, or if it's not. Let's deal with the first one. If it's if an accent or dialect seems to be indicated for a character, should you try and do it in the audition? Well, I think I personally think that it should be asked for. Or I know I don't. You can maybe tell me this if this is an equity rule. I know under ACTRA that they have changed it so that um, you can say you know if you're if you're comfortable uh, you know this person uh, comes from South Dakota, but please do not make it all about the accent. We're more interested in the acting. If you want to do a flavor, that's welcomed. If you want to do one with and one without, that's great too. We try to keep it open because no one should be have, have to pay for dialect coaches. And if you've got forever, uh, I mean, if you've got uh, you know two weeks to prep and you feel that that's going to help your character or you were brilliant at, let's say it's a Russian character and you've got Russian heritage and you feel you know, I'd like to give a flavor of this because I'm really good at this, then I I don't see why not. If they haven't asked for it, you might want to do one with and one without and then label it that way. And then the flip side of that question is for performers who have a natural accent, is that going to be a factor in their consideration for a role? That really, really, really depends on the piece, you know? If it's if it's set in New York and the character cannot be French or sound French in any way, hey, they're even particular about East Coast sound. You know, they still say we say oot in a boat, and I, I've never actually heard anyone say that in real life in Canada. But you know, those are the jokes that used to be made from uh, uh, you know with American producers. <laughs> so um, I think it'll just depend on the story. And also it'll depend on how open the team is to changing that story. If the story, um, you know, that where it is based is a factor of what's going on within that, that play, for example. And whether this is going to take us out. Like I know, you know, if you're, if you've got, it's, it's the same way if you're listening for me, I have all British heritage if I'm listening to really bad British accent while I'm watching a play it completely takes me out and I can't I cannot connect to the character so um, that's the best that I can do to really answer that no that's clear Sorry. The, and everything is you know subjective and specific to the to individual the and the role um, to what extent do CVs and resumes and credits have an impact on someone's consideration for a role? Uh, for me, big. Okay. Yeah, I always look at the resume. Um, I think it's important to have your training on there too. If you haven't done much, if, if there's any kind of training, it's helpful. It's helpful if you speak certain languages, that's helpful to have, you know, anything that would be a special skill that, could be pertinent to anything to do with the business, I think is a good thing to have on there. And I always look at training because sometimes people haven't done anything yet, but I look to see, oh, where do they train or who are their teachers? Ah, oh, okay, that's interesting. So for somebody submitting who hasn't uh, amassed a, much of a resume yet, what advice could you offer? Well, make sure you have at least some training, even if it's classes and you're you're going to, you know, you're taking some acting classes, that's going to be helpful, something that would be helpful to, to see. Or if you're up, you know, if you want to be considered for a singing role, that you've studied singing. I mean, I don't even care if it says you did so-and-so in high school. It all, it's all helpful. I mean, we're talking about theater right now. So generally, 
you know, I can look at a resume with uh, nothing on it except good on a pogo stick and have that person in for TV or film for a long time. But we're talking about a part in a theater production. You're not, we're, we're not going to hire someone for a one-line pogo stick event. Um, this question that popped up about accents and slate. I assume it's correct that in the slate, you should be your natural self. Yes. I would, I would definitely be your natural self. Uh, oh, I do have one, one thing to say on that, though. Yeah. I have to say, if you're talking about, because I see there's some questions here on TV and film. If you're talking about slating for an American series where you have just done a wonderful audition in an American accent, don't give them any reason to go back and check and make sure that, that, that you didn't slip into British at some point. Don't, don't slate with your British. Keep yourself American. Okay. All right. Don't confuse them. Um, I don't know if there's an answer to this question. Okay. What's the, what advice or tips can you offer about how to create connection in a Zoom audition? Um, just really listening to what's been asked of you. And if you're not sure, ask a question. But I because I, I, I've been I through quite a few quite a few Zoom recalls lately. Uh, these are for TV film. But the people who do better are the ones who really are listening to what that director or producer is saying and doing their best to take it in. I can I can see them really listening and you know they're intelligent. And you know they're listening, they're trying their best to do it. Now, to ask for a little clarification, but don't ask something just because you want to talk more and engage more, that kind of thing. Because you're there to do that job and they're there to hire you for that job. Still be friendly with it. I think that's important, but it's about really being engaged with what, what you're there for. You're there to try to do your best to get that part. Um, when you talk about being prepared, does that mean being off book? How much does it matter? Because sometimes you end up with sides that are many, many pages with a, a very short turnaround. How essential is it to be off book? Uh, and what are the other ways that you can be prepared? Um, okay. Well, just, uh... It's funny because I find in, in theater that, that quite often the performers are off book when they, if they're coming in for the director and producer. As a matter of fact, especially the people from England and often from the States, they always comment about, oh my God, these Canadians are so well prepared. It's incredible. And they, you know, I've heard how much they appreciate it. And they say, thank you so much for, you know, and uh, I think that's a great thing. I think the better you know, the, I'm not saying to memorize, but the better you know the material, the more invested you are and the less you're in your head. So that's, that's a general thing, which I'm sure most performers know anyway. Um, because you're, if you are taping, it's a little bit easier though. You can hide the pages or you could put, you know, if you wanna use different eye lines, you could have a thing stuck up here. You could have a thing stuck up here. And you could know bits and pieces in the middle where you're really, you know, you're you're there within the thing. But I, I think it's really good if you can, personally, to try to at least learn the first and the last page. And I hope that if you have a fast turnaround that people aren't, why would you have a fast turnaround in theater unless you're replacing Replace someone them. suddenly right. for a replacement? Yes, I can see that. Try to learn the first and last page and then just be really familiar with the middle part. But they, they should give you enough time to learn it. But but also, another thing, too, is if you're framing here, try to have your page down here, even if you have to blow it up a bit so you can see it, you know, because there's different ways to to cheat as you're as you're looking down, you know. I don't need to see the pages in the frame. Try to keep your pages out of your frame is basically what I'm trying to say, but I don't think there's any problem having them there. Okay. If you're going in for a recall and you're up against the big guns, I would learn it. Right. Um, dance auditions. 
as someone who, who is not a musical theater performer and doesn't do dance auditions, how the heck do you do that? Um, are they asking um, over self-taping a dance audition? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, there are various things. The choreographer should be providing a tape. She, she or he should be, or they should be providing a tape where you can do it in the confines of your basement or your kitchen, right? Or we may ask for, if you do any tricks, you've probably got some a little bit of tape that you could include where you've been in a gym at some point and you've done your series of back handsprings, you know, and you could attach that to the end. If they're just asking for a clip of yourself, try to make sure it's a clip where we can really see you. Like if you've grabbed it from a dance class you're in, Hopefully it's not like the huge wide class and we have to try to figure out who you are. Um, or if that's all you have and that's all you can do and they haven't sent you any choreography to learn and examples of how to do that at choreography, which certainly under ACTRA they have to do. It's not your job to do that. If they have specific uh, choreography they they want, then, then uh, I'm going to lose my train of thought because I'm a little tired. Hold on. <laughs> so great. I just, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, just uh, you would just show whatever they've asked you or just show a little, it doesn't have to be long, just a little clip of some of your bits. And if you're a dancer, you've probably got some clips. You probably do. They don't have to be long, you know. If you're doing a, a few triple pirouettes or whatever that may be, you know, or or you're you're doing something with a partner, if it's a ballet sequence, we just need a little bit of it, like, you know, 15, 20 seconds even is enough, just enough for the choreographer to see, oh, they're really good at that particular thing. Or in particular uh, with people who do acro and stuff like that, I'm sure you've got yourself on tape doing it at some point. Right. So I don't even know if I answered all of that properly. I'm sorry. No, it, it's it's a, it's a good reminder that people have material, pre-existing material that they can submit that as a way to showcase who they are. Yes, I think that's a that's a great thing to do. Uh, you know, almost three years in, I am still uh, insecure and feel incompetent around a lot of the technical elements. How forgiving are is casting around the technical technical expectations for digital self tapes. If you don't have great lighting or a fabulous backdrop or brilliant well, compression. Well, you look, you look perfect. You look, your tape looks better than mine. Mine is too busy. My lighting is bad. Um, <laughs> I think, a, I don't think it's as hard to do as people think it is. You know, really, if you're using, you some of you may not have taken the previous workshops you're doing, but if you're using an iPhone, even, and iPhones are fine, or whatever type of phone, just make sure it's horizontal, you know, landscape view, because otherwise, when it gets uploaded, we end up with big black lines down the side, we end up with this much of you and big black lines down the side, just make sure your framing is good, you don't need an exterior mic or anything like that, if you're using a phone, I think that's fine if the framing is good. You may have to cut, obviously this is where you cut and do a separate take for your slate because you wanna back up and then probably do it again and do your, your slate at that point. Um, in terms of uh, the backdrop, it's helpful if it's not too busy. So, you know, we just, we just tack up a sheet and that's what I've suggested even to a bunch of kids who've auditioned recently, you know, when I was doing Joseph, just, you know, just put up a sheet or try to, find a fairly bare wall that you can do it in front of versus a very, very, very busy scene. That would be helpful. Like if I was auditioning here and I was on the couch, I'd do better lighting and take down that picture. And that's, that's good enough. That's, that's all you really need to do. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be fancy. I mean, I looked at some tapes, you know, I've seen tapes before where a fellow was singing away on his bed and right behind him was another bed with a girl laying in it. And at one point she got up and exited the frame and I realized, oh, that really was a person. <laughs> I've seen tapes with dogs and cats and babies. I think that the world is much more forgiving now. And it's um, not just us, but I think we know that the producers are because they're dealing with it too. 
you know, they're zooming from home and dealing with uh, family or their kid knocking at the door or whatever that may be. So personally, I would cast the cat every time. <laughs> um, For sure. How important is uh, representation in, in considering an audition? Do you take into consideration an actor's talent agent? Does it matter? I think it's important to have representation in terms of them having a handle on everything that's going out all over the place. And there are certainly some agents in the city I know who are, have a, who make it their business to really get to know artistic directors and producers at certain theaters. And so they're, they're tapped into that and they know what's coming up and they know if some suddenly they need a replacement, you know? So uh, just in terms of that, I think that's very, very helpful if we're doing some huge search and um, we don't do just it. If I'm hired to do a huge search, it's extremely rare that it's ever just through agents. I don't think, I don't remember in 10 years, anything that was not also through an open call. So you, you should find out about it. It's just about whether or not you hear about it in a timely fashion. Do you have any uh, advice or input to offer around voiceover auditions? Mm, not really. Okay. Uh, a recurring question. And you don't have to answer this right away, but maybe I'll just stick it in your head. If you could offer three tips for things to do and three things not to do, what might they be? <laughs> I could I could offer a ton. Only three? That's a oh okay. Go crazy. <laughs> okay, well I can make it short, and uh, this isn't because I make any money from this, but I did do a series with Naomi Ser uh, Sneakers. We created a web series before COVID, actually called the Casting Room, where it was based on all the things I saw go wrong in auditions, but we did it with humor. And, you know, a lot of Second City folks came in and, you know, things like bringing in a photo that's 20 years old or uh, coming in and saying, you know, I didn't really like that part. I think I, I really feel I'm more this part before you even have a go at your own part or being late and all the excuses for being late or all those sorts of things. Those, uh, you know, there was a ton of that stuff in it. It was all um, uh, I, I just say done with humor and love, but all those things do happen. Um, Learn your lines to the best of your ability. Be prepared and on time. And be professional in the room. We want to know that you want to be there. Enjoy your time in that room. Things you don't do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. I would, I don't know, things you do, don't do. Be dis disrespectful to the team. I mean, you know, just be a good human being. <laughs> I think that's that's it. I mean, are you talking about in the room? Are you talking about on tape? Talking about on tape. On tape. I'm Apologies then. Um, on tape. Make sure that the image is as clear as you can possibly get it. Um, Make sure that you, you are invested in, in the role, like you've really connected to the material and you think about it. It's funnily, you know, when I think about particularly TV auditions, because I'm assuming theater auditions are going to be bigger, you don't have as much to go on. And there are, I, uh, there are ways to make something interesting by really thinking about it. You know, why would I be doing this? It's another way of thinking about it. Or what studio or network is it for? Because the way I'm going to approach this role is going to be different if this is a sci-fi versus if it's a comedy versus if it's a, it's something for Hallmark. And I think the same goes for theater. You should do your research and know your material. That would be actually back in the to-do column. You know, and do your best to research what it is you're auditioning for. What is the role like? You know, has, has this play or musical ever been on before? If not, 
what is the style of music? What is style of music that these these writers usually do? What, you know, that sort of thing. You know, get, get as much information as you can to help arm you with the way you want to put across your, your material. Um, don't apologize in the middle. Uh, if you've got a bad take, make sure you remove it. A lot of people don't go, don't take the time to watch what they've just sent. And I get ones with blurbs in between or, or talking to the reader going, yeah, that wasn't so good, right? Should we, yeah, let's pick it up again from here. You know, um, you probably don't want to show that. You probably don't. And and the other thing in, in terms of theater actors too is again, the makeup thing can really, you know, if I'm looking for somebody 20 and you caked on pancake like you would at the theater and lots of makeup, you know, I'm assuming this is for a, a, a female. Um, it can really age you and also it, it doesn't look natural on the camera at all. Um, I don't know, there's a few. That's a, a wealth, that's amazing. Thank you. Get your, get your tape in on time because you could miss out. You could miss out. I've seen tapes come in five hours later and the roll's gone. Is there any advantage to getting your tape in early? Oh, sure. But only if you're ready, only if you're ready. Let's face like if I'm going to get in, uh, I don't know. Let's say I'm getting 50 tapes in in one week. I'm talking theater. TV film, I could get 50 tapes in overnight. I'm going to watch them in the order they come in. I'm going to be fresher at the beginning than at the end. Right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, getting in early, but I will still watch them all. And I have a longer prep period for theater myself, but I don't know how it is for others. Right. You know, let's face it, if they're in a desperate situation in a theater and they're, they're uh, you know, at the theater and they've lost somebody and they've got a cat who, if they suddenly see two or three people who are right, right at the beginning in the first three hours of submissions, that part's going to probably get cast because they're worried about it. And the same thing happens in TV and film. Right. Definitely. So that, that was going to be a follow-up question. If, if a role is being cast and they think they found the person Will they stop looking at tape? I that I don't know. Uh, in terms of TV and film, will they stop looking at tape? That's really up to the director and producer. I wouldn't stop looking at tape because I don't get the final say. But will will the if if the director or producer or whomever in the theater is looking at it, they might. But I can't answer for another person. And certainly in TV and film, I'll be honest, if I have to do a one day turnaround, someone's gotta be on set. I've had this happen on the same day. Someone just showed up, they've just tested positive. I need them tonight in wardrobe, you know, and you're going, ah, oh. luckily usually it's a line, you know, put it out urgent, da, 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 really sorry, but anybody that you can get, see as many as I can and I send them in batches and they may suddenly see it. And, there you go, because you remember, we also have to get a studio and network to approve immediately, too. So those are more the emergency situations, and I think yeah. you would know if if it was. I think it would hopefully say on the breakdown what's going on. Uh, here's a question that relates to setup. Is it worth trying to kind of set the scene and create the scene for an audition? Say, for example, it was a, I don't know, in a restaurant. Frame it sitting at a table with stuff or I, distracting. I, um, too much is distracting, but a little bit is okay. I think if your scene is at a table, I would sit. If you feel like you want to, I don't think we, we don't, and let's face it, this is for you. It's again, it's not for us. Are we going to look at it and go, oh, nice table. I should hire that person. Yeah. Ooh, I like the cutlery. I like the cutlery there. That's my kind of person. Um, but if you feel like, uh, you know, you want to have that and the person is, is drinking wine and that's part of the, or a coffee or whatever it may be in the scene, I think that that's fine. Don't make it too busy. Don't make it all about that. But I, mm -hmm. You know, you got to be careful, like it's not constant because, you know, remember, it's like this. And if you're seeing this all the time, you know, that's distracting. But if if it's just an occasional thing or whatever, and it's helpful to you, then I think that's fine. And sitting is fine and having a table in front of you because maybe your pages are there, too. 
right? Right. Or sometimes you're on a computer. That's another one too, right? Like uh, your role is maybe in an office. Yeah. And so what I've suggested to people who've had to learn quickly is, you know, open up your laptop and have your pages right there. You know, the filming is happening here and you might be talking to the person there, but you're going back and here's the thing, or maybe the, the sign, the lines are on the screen, or maybe it's a piece of paper that's sitting there, you know, anything to help you get to where you need to be. That's sort of the, the overarching advice. Yeah. <laughs> um, related to social media, how often, if at all, does casting look up an actor's website, if they have one? I don't. <laughs> I don't. I'm, I think people younger than me who are more into that might, but I don't. I, I mean, maybe if I was doing a, I don't know, cooking show or something and someone they needed a real cook and I heard so-and-so was a real cook. Would I look up that site? Yeah. Yeah. I guess I would, depending on the situation. Um, when you were reviewing initial tape, how much of that do you forward to production or the director? Every single person I think is right. Unless it's a, unless it's TV and film and it's a producer who says, Honey, I am hiring you for your taste. Give me your top five. If I don't like them, I'll take your next five. Okay. There you go. But we see a lot more for theater. Definitely. When you're looking at resumes, does where a person got training make a difference? Well, I think it can be helpful, you know. If you've you've gone to a great school or something like that, you know, I saw that you, for example, graduated George Brown. I think, oh, okay, they've had some pretty solid training there. You know, that's it's helpful. We're we're starting to get close to our time, and there are a slew of more questions here. Um, but rather than try and pick and choose, is there anything? you would offer uh, as advice or, or just wisdom for all of the people who are feeling a bit overwhelmed by the whole experience of having to do taped auditions and Zoom auditions? It's... Uh... It's a tough one. I think I think the good news is that, and I'm sorry, I don't know if you have a rule yet with equity, but this certainly would be a good one. Luckily, in Canada under ACTRA, we have adopted what they've taken on in London is that you cannot have more than eight pages. I don't know whether you have that under equity. And I think that's a good pay, a good thing to have. And I've had, you know, sides come up from the States and have said, you know what, we can't do this. This is too much. And often their turnarounds are too fast. Um, I think you just have to enjoy it and do the best you do the best you can. And, and if if you're overwhelmed, pick the ones you really want to do. There will be there will be other opportunities. Pick the ones that you want to do most first. It's hard. I mean, I get overwhelmed sometimes with everything that comes in, and I just take each thing as it comes and look at what deadline is first and and go for that. And because uh, if you're not really enjoying it, then I think that's that's the most important thing here is, you know, and looking after yourself as well, taking time for yourself. Like you can't, it's hard to just be an actor. You have to have other things in your life that make you happy as well. Um, I don't think you should worry about self tapes. You know, Dina's worried about it. And look at her. She's perfect. Uh, just go for that. <laughs> it's not as complicated as it sounds. And I think that if you overthink it with the, you know, the setups and the lighting and this and that and the other, you know, it can be simpler than that. Just remember not to make it too busy and don't give yourself a lot of things that you feel, oh, this is going to make this character better because it's really more about what's in here and how you connect to that part. I think that's probably the best that I could say, really. I, I don't think we can top that. Um, try and enjoy it. Have a life. Don't stress. Yeah. 
Thank you very, very much, Stephanie. Oh, you're welcome. It's been tremendous, uh, both your experience and, and your wisdom and your outlook are, are so encouraging. And, and I, I hope everyone everyone is throwing in. They're very, oh, lots, lots, lots of, of nice, lots, lots of, of nice here. You, See, and, this is what uh, happens when you get older, you get wise. <laughs> <laughs> so you all have something to look forward to. And thank you for all the thank yous. I and, appreciate uh, it. And for everyone attending, the the recording of this will be uh, available on the website for you to review at any point. And, and for those who couldn't make it, hopefully they will check it out as well. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Dina. My pleasure. Thank it's you so nice much. Nice job. <laughs> okay. Thank you both thank you. Uh, for, for this conversation. It's been jam-packed. What a jam-packed 70 minutes it's been. Uh, thank you so much. I want to thank you, Stephanie, and I want to thank you, Dina, for, for moderating this conversation, and also to our ASL interpreters, Francine mm -hmm. and Danica. Thank you for being with us and providing access uh, in that way, and thanks to everybody who attended, especially um, especially all of our members who are online. Uh, you, will, uh, you will get... Uh, uh, a link to a survey, please fill it out. It's really, really helpful for us moving forward. Uh, if you've missed uh, any of our previous workshops, you can check them out on Equity's YouTube channel. They will all be posted there. And uh, on behalf of the association, thank you so much for attending. We will see you at the next one. Our next webinar is on Monday. So check your email for registrations uh, for that one. Uh, okay. Take care, everybody, and, uh, and have a great day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks, you all. Stephanie. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>